or good afternoon. Welcome to today, today's program, The New Era in Atrial Fibrillation Screening at Home. My na name is Bernd Senner, and I'm from the Bethesda Hospital in Wuppertal in Germany. That's a city north of Frankfurt and east of Cologne. And it's a pleasure to, me, to be joined today by two colleagues, two colleagues, specialists in their field, cardiologists and electrophysiologists, One is from the United Kingdom, it's Professor Faisal Osman. Hi, Faisal. Hi, hi, Ben. Good. And the other colleague is from Japan, actually from Kyoto in Japan, from the Prefectural University of Medicine. Hi, good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Before we start today's session, let's have a quick look at the agenda. And today's program entails a combination of presentation and discussions. And after the introduction, we'll start with the, the first talk that's about importance of early detection of atrial fibrillation to prevent strokes and improve AF treatment. The second talk will be about the new 2020 guidelines for the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. The third talk will be about new tools for AF screening and its cl clinical evidence. And after that, We'll have time for questions and answers and discussions and then the closing remarks. Well, please remember and feel free to submit as many questions as you like. And there's a box below and we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible during our discussion towards the end of today's webinar. But before we start, let's briefly recap on today's learning objectives and the webinar overview. These are the ESC 2020 guidelines for atrial fibrillation and the use of one lead ECG devices. Insights on the effect, well, I didn't do that. Insights on the effect of a atrial fibrillation for patients if not diagnosed or treated in time. How patients can benefit from new tools for screening atrial fibrillation and the importance of early detection. And as a reminder, this session has been created by Radcliffe Cardiology and is supported by Omron Healthcare. So I'd like to start with the first presentation. And the first presentation is about the importance of early detection of atrial fibrillation to prevent strokes and improve atrial fibrillation treatment. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia in adults, and it's estimated that 2% to 4% of the adult population suffer from this rhythm disturbance. It is more common in males than in females, and the lifetime risk is about 37%. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with age. That means that 95% of patients with atrial fibrillation are older than 60 years. On the other hand, that means that it's rarely seen in the younger population. 30% of atrial fibrillation patients have at least one and 10% at least two hospital admissions annually. Depending on the underlying atrial substrate at the muscle bundle level, atrial fibrillation is, I have to go back, is paroxysmal. That means it starts and stops spontaneously. It is persistent, meaning that usually cardioversion is needed for interruption of AFib or it is long standing persist persistent. But we will hear about that later during the other quantum talks. The global impact of atrial fibrillation is huge. It is estimated that about 43.6 million individuals had pre prevalent atrial fibrillation in 2016. And it's more common in the Western hemispheres, as you can see on this figure, like the United States, Canada, or Europe, and less frequent in, let's say, China and Africa. It is estimated that there will be a real increase in the prevalence and incidence of atrial fibrillation during the next 40 years. 
And this is mainly due to the increasing life expectancy and furthermore an increasing risk factor burden like smoking, alcohol consumption, increasing body mass index, hypertension, heart failure, and diabetes. And as you can see on the figure, that's mainly due to the increase in the age group of the 80 plus patients. And this is due to the increasing life expectancy in this group. Atrial fibrillation is often a marker of underlying heart and vascular disease. The, one of the main risk factors is hypertension or obesity. And there are several modifiable risk factors. These diseases and risk factors are often symptomatic. And whenever you have one of these risk factors or underlying diseases, you should think that this patient might have additional atrial fibrillation. Well, while these diseases are usually symptomatic, atrial fibrillation by itself might be asymptomatic or silent. If it is sym symptomatic, patients complain of chest pain or uh, dyspnea at exertion. And if they are hemodynamically unstable, they might have syncopes, pulmonary edema, or even in rare cases, a cardiogenic shock. But even if um, atrial fibrillation is asymptomatic, it also contributes to adverse outcome. There's an increased risk of death, and it's 2.4 fold for men and 3.5 fold for women. There's an increased incidence of stroke that's four times higher in men and nearly six times higher in women. And there's also an increased incidence of heart failure. It's three times higher in men and 11 times higher in women. Well, and there's also an increased risk of cognitive impairment and even dementia. Well, how can we explain that? On the one hand, atrial fibrillation leads to thrombus formation in the left atrium, resulting in silent infarcts or clinical strokes. Furthermore, there are inflammatory processes, the CRP levels rise, IL-6 is increasing. And in addition, there's a beat to beat variability with a decreased cardiac output resulting in a decreased cerebral blood flow. And all these pathogenetic me mechanisms result in brain morphometric changes and last but not least in cognitive impairment or even dementia. Well, let's talk about the pathogenesis of stroke. This is a very interesting study performed in the Western suburbs in Adelaide in Australia. Nearly 150,000 patients or people were observed for a period of 12 months. And during this period, there were 318 stroke events, 16% of these hemorrhagic and 84% of these ischemic. And ischemic stroke pathogenesis was classified. And in nearly 30% of stroke patients, stroke was attributed to atrial fibrillation. A new onset atrial fibrillation at the time of diagnosis was found in nearly 30% with a cardioembolic event. That means in 10% of all stroke events. And you can see the cardioembolic strokes with the light blue on the figure to the left. You all are aware of the Framingham study, and it's about more than 5,000 patients that were followed for 40 years. In this population, there were 501 stroke events, ischemic stroke events, and 103 of them were based on atrial fibrillation. And this study examined the impact of uh, different kinds of stroke on survival, recurrence, and disability rate. And what could be shown was, was that atrial fibrillation-related strokes compared to ischemic strokes secondary to arterial disease commonly resulted in greater disability, an increased mortality, and in increased recurrence rates of stroke, as you can see in the lower panel to the left. That means stroke and atrial fibrillation was in this study nearly twice as likely to be fatal. 
And that means that prevention is crucial. But you can only prevent strokes if you're aware that the patient has atrial fibrillation. And that's the problem about asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. Well, what is the, the outcome of patients with asymptomatic atrial fibrillation with regard to strokes and all-cause mortality? And in this study, there were more than 5,500 patients that were observed for a period of three years, and they were age and gender matched to more than or close to 25,000 controls. And these data show that asymptomatic atrial fibrillation detected incidentally is associated with a significant adverse effect on stroke. You can see that on the left side and death, as you can see on the right side. For stroke, the risk mounted to a 2.3 fold increase versus control as was the mortality rate. And the excess stroke and mortality rates even underestimated the outcome of undetected atrial fibrillation as half of this cohort was placed on oral anticoagulation. Well, what is the long-term prognosis of patients with asymptomatic atrial fibrillation and stroke compared to symptomatic patients? And this was examined in this observational non-interventional trial in more than 1,000 patients with an observation period of 10 years. And compared with symptomatic patients, those that are asymptomatic have a higher mortality, more frequently progression to permanent atrial fibrillation. And you can see that on the upper figure to the left and the highest stroke rate, that's the lower figure. The risk of atrial fibrillation progression to permanent atrial fibrillation was 1.6, despite active rhythm control. And the risk of ischemic stroke was 1.8, despite oral anticoagulation in 80% of these patients. Well, how do we detect asymptomatic atrial fibrillation? And that's difficult. One study tried to find predictors for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, and they could show that there was a likelihood if it was non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that the heart rate was below 100 beats per minute, the CHATS VAS score was zero, or there was a history of diabetes, or patients uh, of male gender. But as you can see, this is a huge population, so screening seems to be essential. Treatment of atrial fibrillation stands on three columns. That's, of course, anticoagulation. It's better symptom control in patients that are symptomatic. And it's a management of comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factors. But I think there should also be a fourth column, and that's rhythm control. These are data from the EAST AFNET4 trial that was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. East AFNET4 stands for Early Treatment of Atrial Fibrillation for Stroke Prevention Trial. And it was a strategy of early rhythm control therapy compared to evidence-based usual care in nearly 3,000 patients with early atrial fibrillation and concomitant cardiovascular conditions. And they were followed for 5.1 years in the median. And what they could show that an early rhythm control therapy is associated with a lower risk of adverse cardiovascular outcomes, including stroke, death from cardiovascular cause, hospitalization for heart failure or acute coronary syndromes, then usual care, including anticoagulation. But these data are valid only if they, they are treated early in the course of their disease. So, they have a prognostic benefit from stroke. Disabling stroke is often the first manifestation of atrial fibrillation. And the stroke risk, as you all know, can be estimated with the chats vast score. And the stroke risk depends mainly on comorbidities. But the good news is 
Atrial fibrillation-related strokes are largely preventable by oral anticoagulation. The risk of stroke and systemic emboli can be reduced by 60 to 70% by the use of warfarin and by an additional 19% with NOx, that means non-vitamin K dependent oral anticoagulants. But once again, you have to know that the patient has atrial fibrillation and you have to treat them early. And so I want to summarize. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained arrhythmia in adults. It is associated with a markedly increased risk of stroke, but also of heart failure, dementia, and death. Early detection of atrial fibrillation, especially if it is asymptomatic, is necessary in order to prevent complications and reduce morbidity and mortality. So thank you. This is the first talk and we will move on and come to the next talk. The next talk will be given by Professor Faisal Osman. He is a cardiologist and an electrophysiologist. He's from the United Kingdom. He is a professor of cardiology at Warwick Medical School and at the University Hospital in Coventry. And he will talk about um, the new 2020 guidelines for the diagnosis and management of atrial fibrillation. So Faisal, we are interested in your talk. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Professor Sanitz, very kind. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the new ESC guidelines uh, that have been published last year on the diagnosis and uh, management of AF. Now, the European Society of Cardiology um, has been producing guidance for about 20 years now, and really they've been very, very uh, useful in helping us with management um, for patients with AF. They're usually updated uh, every few years and uh, take into account all of the new data that is published, and the last update happened last year. Uh, Professor Sanner has very eloquently uh, gone through the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation. We know it's a very, very common condition, has a high prevalence and in incidence, particularly in the Western world. We also know from studies that the estimates uh, of the prevalence and in incidence of AF are rising. Over the coming several decades, we are going to be seeing more and more patients with atrial fibrillation as the, pa as the patients now age, their risk factors accumulate, and I'll talk a little bit about risk factors we also know males are, are at slightly higher risk. Um, and something that actually puts things quite starkly into context is if you consider uh, patients at an index age of 55, there is a one in three chance of, of developing atrial fibrillation in a lifetime. And that's, that's huge when you think about it. The classification for atrial fibrillation uh, remains fairly unchanged and has been devised and was last updated in 2016. Um, and really the, the, the classification um, remains the, the same. However, the guidelines do talk about avoiding certain terminologies that we should try and abandon because of the confusion that they can cause. So terms like low atrial fibrillation, valvular and non-valvular atrial fibrillation and chronic AF ideally should be abandoned. Now, again, Professor Sanna touched on some of these. Why is, clear, why is atrial fibrillation so important? Well, we know that there is a, 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 can be a variety of presentations and there are some very, very important outcome measures that are associated with AF. We know there's a, an increased mortality, there's a higher risk of stroke, which, uh, which we're all aware of, uh, increased risk of uh, heart failure and LV systolic dysfunction and of cognitive impairment and vascular dementia, which is increasingly being recognized. Importantly, there are also um, important effects on the uh, impairment of quality of life and repeated hospitalizations for heart failure. And along with that, the psychological impact of all of this and an increase in depression. Um, and patients, importantly, patients who present with atrial fibrillation uh, can often be asymptomatic. And as Professor Sanna said, a lot of patients don't even know they've got atrial fibrillation. And these patients particularly can be at very high risk of, of, of things like stroke. They don't even know they have AF. We also know that AF symptoms can be highly variable, particularly at first presentation, and that symptoms can change. So patients can become asymptomatic over time. 
Stroke and systemic embolism, which we know is associated with AF, is very much dependent on comorbidities. Uh, and that those patients that end up getting cardioembolic uh, strokes often have strokes that are more severe, that are often more fatal. Uh, and if patients survive, they often lead to greater disability. And this can be devastating for patients. So what's new in the new ESC guidance? Well, when it comes to diagnosis, the, uh, the guidelines stipulate that a standard 12 lead ECG is important. Um, however, there's a recognition now that, of course, we have single channel ECGs that are also available increasingly to our patients. And so if there is a single channel recording, a tracing of 30 seconds or more of a heart rhythm showing no discernible P waves, um, an absence of P waves and an irregular rhythm in the absence of AV node disease it di is diagnostic of clinical atrial fibrillation. Screening is also highly recommended by the, uh, by the ESC guidelines. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but it will just draw your attention to the definitive diagnosis of AF uh, or definite diagnosis in, in those that screen positively, again, should be based on either a 12 bit ECG or a rhythm strip containing 30 seconds or more um, of atrial fibrillation that a physician can then review and have a look at. So this is what we typically see. These are two rhythm strips, one showing sinus rhythm uh, with clear P waves, um, an irregular RR interval with a QRS complex following each P wave. And in atrial fibrillation, there is complete absence of these P waves. Um, there is an irregularity to the rhythm. So the RR intervals are completely irregular. Now, Again, this was touched on, risk factors for atrial fibrillation, and this really has been brought to the, to the, to the fore in the new ESC guidelines. You'll see from the, uh, from the figure on the left-hand side, there are a number of factors that are associated with uh, risk work for atrial fibrillation. Now, some of these, such as aging, uh, genetics, ethnicity, gender, we can't really do much about. However, there are many things that we can have an impact on, uh, things such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, being overweight or obese, and these are things we can tackle, uh, physical inactivity, smoking intake, alcohol intake, uh, lipids, and being hyper, having hyperlipidemia, and also increasingly being recognized is the risk of sleep apnea in these, in these patients. Uh, and the ESC guidelines now do recognize that and actually uh, suggest that we should identify and manage these risk factors and these comorbid conditions. Uh, and they give that a, a level of a recommendation of one. And actually to try and modify these risk factors as best we can, once we identify them, to try and reduce the AF burden and improve symptoms for patients. Uh, interestingly, opportunistic screening of AF is also recommended in all hypertensives um, as a class one recommendation and as a class two way in those with sleep apnea. And for somebody like me, an electrophysiologist, we do AF ablation. The recommendation is that weight loss, of course, is very, very important. We know that excess weight has a, a poorer outcome in terms of maintaining sinus rhythm. And certainly patients uh, should be encouraged to lose weight. And anyone being considered for an AF ablation, if they have an elevated body mass index, really should have measures put in place to try and lose weight as best they can. Now, uh, Professor Sanu will be talking after me about the screening tools. So over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a major shift and a major advance in the, the tools that are available in primary care. And also in secondary care, we often rely on things like pulse checks. Patients often have blood pressure monitors and cuffs that they use at home, which can detect the pulse rate uh, and also plethysmography through smartphones. But increasingly, these smart devices and smartphones and even smart watches can now actually uh, give, give us uh, a single strip or multi-channel ECG tracing, which of course becomes very, very important. And the ESC guidelines do talk about uh, performing opportunistic screening uh, in all patients who are 65 or more. Uh, in those that are 75 or more, particularly with high risk factors, uh, they recommend some kind of systematic ECG monitoring um, as well. And the importance is that whenever we are talking about clinical atrial fibrillation, a definite diagnosis of AF does rely, even in screen positive cases, of a physician reviewing a 12 lead ECG or a single channel ECG recording uh, with atrial fibrillation that's there for 30 seconds or more. 
Now, this slide you've also seen as well, um, the characterization of atrial fibrillation, the 4S approach. So it's important now to assess uh, stroke risk using Chad's VAS scoring, um, to assess the symptom severity through taking our history, quality of life, uh, quality of life assessment, or, or through using the European Heart Rhythm Association symptom scoring scale. Getting some handle on the severity of the AF burden, both the temporal pattern of the AF, but importantly, the total AF burden that the patient may have. And also an assessment of the substrate of the, of the atrial fibrillation. And again, this is where cardiovascular risk factors and comorbidities become very important. And also a recommendation that we have some kind of assessment of the presence of atrial cardiomyopathy through clinical assessment, but also through imaging parameters such as echocardiography, CT, and increasingly now cardiac MRI scanning. This is quite a nice slide about the integrated management of, of our patients. So the diagram on the left has the uh, patient at the top of the pyramid, um, having a very patient-centered approach to how we manage our patients. We try and optimize stroke risk and make sure we treat the, the stroke risk appropriately. We deal with symptoms through rate control with or without rhythm control. And increasingly now we are more focused on rhythm control. Management of cardiovascular risk factors, which really is critical in terms of our success longer term and treatment of those comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension. And also highlighting the importance of patient education and of lifestyle modification, not forgetting the psychological impacts as well. And all of this of course, to try and improve strategies that will promote patients uh, to actually continue their medication and their lifestyle changes. And again, a recognition that AF is actually managed by a team, a multidisciplinary team with healthcare professionals from a variety of backgrounds. And it's important that those that team works closely together, that there's a clear plan for follow-up and that there is clear and good communication between primary and, uh, and secondary care for these AF patients. This is the CHADS VAS score and the HASBLED score that I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with. Uh, I just draw your attention to the C, uh, the congestive heart failure aspect of the CHADS VAS score, which now does include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. cardiomyopathy. So a recognition that, uh, that HOCAM is associated with a higher risk of stroke. And so that is now included in the, in the guidance. Guidance Guidelines also do talk about the HASBLED scoring, uh, which is shown on the slide here. Uh, and specify that the NOACs that are currently available, the doses we should be using, and where there is a reduced dose, the indications of when that reduced dose should be, should be given. This is the slide that talks about uh, who should be considered for anticoagulant uh, therapy. So patients who have mechanical prosthetic valves uh, or moderate to severe uh, mitral stenosis, it, they should be getting vitamin K antagonists, but all other patients should have an assessment of their chance fast scoring system. And if they have a low score, so they're zero for males or one for females, then they don't need any antithrombotic therapy. However, if the score is higher, then clearly based on the chance fast score, they should have some assessment of their bleeding risk with, with Hasbled or an equivalent and an, and a, an attempt to try and minimize the bleeding risk, particularly those that have a score of three or more from Hasbled. And also the guidelines are quite clear that no acts are now positioned ahead of the vitamin K antagonists uh, because of all the data that's uh, been available really for the last five to 10 years on the NOAX. There's also a recognition that a lot of our patients have devices in them now. So be that pacemakers or ICDs, CRT devices, and these devices can often pick up uh, atrial high rates. And of course, the patients may not have uh, a 12 EC, 12 ECG or uh, a strip, uh, a rhythm strip more than 30 seconds. And so these atrial high rates or subclinical AF episodes are also very important. And we are now seeing more and more patients who present to our follow-up clinics. And the ESE guidelines provide a, a nice uh, schema, which you see here on the right-hand side, where, where an assessment of risk stroke is made with a chance fast scoring system. And the AF burden or the subclinical AF burden is assessed. And the important thing here is to reassess regularly and have a close discussion with the patient about the benefits and risks of oral anticoagulation. And certainly those that have a higher transfer score with a high burden of these atrial high rates 
should be considered for oral anticoagulation and trials are ongoing to answer specific questions on this. Now, several trials, of course, have been published um, and Professor Sander has touched on uh, one or two of these. Um, catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation and heart failure, the Castle AF study uh, was, was a, a big trial looking at heart failure and showed mortality benefits in selected patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We have the Cabana study that's been published and very recently that Professor Sana very nicely showed was the EAST trial that showed that early rhythm control in patients who've just been diagnosed with AF within the last year actually has benefit longer term. And so with that in mind, the ESC guidelines uh, looking at rhythm control, so this slide talks about drugs, remains fairly unchanged with the sort of class one and class three drugs that are available to us to treat um, atrial fibrillation. I just highlight again that patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction were left with amiodarone, a very powerful antiarrhythmic drug, but not the best one really to be on long term and does have some drawbacks to it. And catheter ablation, of course, is mentioned uh, on this slide and electrophysiologists uh, such as myself, uh, we perform AF ablation um, using usually either uh, 3D mapping and radiofrequency ablation to isolate um, the veins primarily within the left atrium or using cryo balloon technology. And more and more of these procedures being done and high volume centers have generally speaking very good outcomes. And we and others have uh, shown that actually these cases can be performed as day cases or same day procedures. And this was a, a publication that we published uh, just a few months ago. And if you again look at the guidelines in terms of AF ablation, you can see that some of the evidence has now been taken into account. Uh, a class one indication for patients with atrial fibrillation who failed medical therapy, um, can, they can be considered for catheter ablation. For selected patients with reduced uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, again, a class one indication for those patients uh, based on the Castle AF trial. And importantly, and you can see this at the top of this slide, uh, patient choice, of course, is critical. Uh, an important dis discussion with the patient about the benefits and risks of an AF ablation. And again, highlighting the need for tackling those modifiable risk factors, uh, particularly those patients who are undergoing atrial fibrillation to reduce their risk of having a recurrence after the ablation has been done. So to summarize, um, the 2020 ESC guidelines provide a very solid framework for us to, to be able to manage our patients. Uh, there is a, a drive now to use the CC to ABC approach to confirm the atrial fibrillation on 12 DDCG or a single channel recording of 30 seconds or more to confirm the atrial fibrillation, to characterize the atrial fibrillation using the 4S approach so to assess the stroke risk, the symptom severity, uh, to assess the burden of atrial fibrillation and some assessment of the, the substrate of the myocardium. And then when it comes to treatment, using the ABC approach to consider anticoagulation in the, in the right patients at the right time, to control uh, the symptoms that the patients are, are maybe experiencing uh, with rate and importantly rhythm control, and also to tackle the comorbid conditions and the cardiovascular risk factors that go along with atrial fibrillation. And all of this to place the patient really at the center of what we do and recognizing that we have a very multidisciplinary approach and to have clear lines of communication between the various specialties that are involved. And with that, I'll hand back to Professor Sanad. Thank you very much. Okay, Faisal, thank you very, very much, Professor Osman, for this very nice talk about the new 2020 guidelines. And for the audience, please remember to submit your Q's questions in the Q&A box below so that we can answer them at the end of the talk. We will now come to our third talk this afternoon. And for him, it's not afternoon, it's deep in the night because he is right now sitting in Japan. It's one o'clock in the night. And Katara Sanu studied at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. And he is now a senior lecturer at Kyoto Prefectural University um, in Japan. And he's a cardiologist and an electrophysiologist. And we are interested in your talk. And the new talk will the talk will be about new tools for atrial fibrillation screening and its clinical evidence. So please. Okay, thank you for <coughs> introducing me, Professor Sana. I'm very Honored to give my presentation today. Thank you. 
So the early diagnosis of atrial fibrillation may have several benefits, including individualized lifestyle intervention and edge coagulation, and maybe associated with a reduction in complications and healthcare cost. And as you can see, a variety of monitoring tools are developed for now. And the left side shows the smartwatch companies like a cardio brand and the Apple Watch and a Fitbit and a Xiaomi Samsung Weddings. And the right side shows other devices companies such as handheld or patch EKG companies. And the importance of early diagnosis has been recognized in recent ESC guidelines, as shown Professor Osman, the which recommended opportunistic screening using pulse palpation and then EKG rhythm strip in person older than 65 years old. So how about each tool's performance? According to the published data, all tools have achieved high sensitivity and specificity for atrial fibrillation detection. For example, the single lead ECG sensitivity is about 94 to 98% and the specificity is 76 to 95%. Like single lead EKG, smartphone apps, which means PPG and a smartwatch, same as the single lead EKG, have also achieved high sensitivity and specificity. So, and uh, recently, more and more companies are developing deep learning model to improve device performance. For example, this is a bit logic platform for EKG interpretation, and this study validated the platform using electrophysiologist adjudicated real world data and publicly available validation data. And the deep learning models were trained to perform beat and rhythm detection and classification using EKG collecting with the Preventis Body Guardian Heart Monitors as shown in this slide. And the beat detection sensitivity was 99.7%. And atrial fibrillation sensitivity was 96%. And the sinus sensitivity was 97%. And the VT sensitivity was 97%. So tech company like Preventis Solution appears one after another and advanced in EKG interpretation by the AI algorithm has moved on to the next stage. So today I'd like to briefly talk about the performance of complete wireless upper arm blood pressure monitor with EKG paired with an automated rhythm adjudication AI algorithm for the detection of atrial fibrillation, which is made by Omron Healthcare Company. The patient were instructed to perform two times blood pressure measurements and a 30 second EKG recording of bipolar lead one rhythm strip by touching the electrodes located on the top face and the both the sides of the monitor. If a recording could not be interpreted as normal or possible atrial fibrillation, the patient were instructed to perform another measurement. Within two hours of the measurements with the complete device, the 12 lead EKG recording were obtained. This series of processes was performed before and after ablation during the patient hospitalization. And the baseline characteristic and the measurement data of the study population are listed in table one. To test the accuracy of the complete automated algorithm for detecting possible atrial fibrillation, the sensitivity and the specificity for detecting possible atrial fibrillation were 100% and 86% respectively. And to assess the fidelity and overall quality of complete rhythm recording and transmission, physician interpreted complete recording 
and trail lead ECG were compared. The, as you can see this slide, the sensitivity and the specificity were 99% and 85%. And now we are doing multi-center prospective observational study by using this blood pressure monitor with EKG. And a study population is 100 persistent atrial fibrillation patient undergoing catheter ablation. And the primary endpoint and the secondary endpoint are listed in this table. And I'll briefly explain our study protocol. In our study, 100 persistent atrial fibrillation patients were enrolled and followed up for one year after ablation. The primary endpoint is the time to atrial fibrillation detection in comparison with the usual care during the follow-up. And the secondary outcome is an agreement between the Omron device and the standard Holter monitoring performed every three months. And a patient are routinely followed up in clinical practice because the results of the devices are blinded to both the patients and clinicians. And we have completely all the patient registration and are now following up those patients. So we'll see. And this is another study called the atrial fibrillation awareness campaign the AFib Aware study. So we, we have been holding the disease awareness symposium since 2019 and more than 1,600 elderly people aged more than 65 years old participated. And the participants are instructed to measure blood pressure monitor with EKG and uh, answer the question about atrial fibrillation knowledge. And finally, received the atrial fibrillation education by me. And the results of the AFib Aware study will be presented at the at, uh, European Heart Rhythm Association 2029, to, uh, 2021, uh, this April. So this is a paper from Dr. Marcus, which raised uh, an alarm over the screening for atrial fibrillation using the smartwatches. With the advent of smart technologies, like something I introduced today, uh, early atrial fibrillation detection has become possible. But however, on the other hand, this paper pointed out the tech company like Apple has bypassed expert consensus to initiate screening for atrial fibrillation in the general population. The left side shows the conventional workflow for research output, and the right side shows workflow involving wearable technologies. As you can see the right figure, due to the direct marketing by tech company, to patients and the general public. They, they consume information and approach clinicians for appropriate information. And therefore, this report say that the several additional steps in the workflow for the use of the wearable technologies to, to, to detect atrial fibrillation are urgently needed. So how do the healthcare providers who are actually seeing the wearable detected atrial fibrillation, feel about the current situation. So according to the survey of the healthcare professionals by AF Screening International Collaboration, I'm, I, I'm a member of this the collaboration, uh, collaboration, and uh, the referral to the physicians of patients for clinical evaluation after atrial fibrillation detection through the wearable devices or apps in more than 50% of cases was related to patient self-referral or was prompted by uh, primary care physicians. 
And this slide shows important the disadvantages in mass community screening using wearable devices. The around 65% of respondents worry about anxiety in people with a positive test. And also 41% of respondents concerned false reassurance in case of a negative test. So what, what should we con consider for the proper use of advanced technology? And what action should be taken against the lay public and the healthcare providers? So I'd like to suggest what should we do? We clinicians and researchers should conduct the high quality research to inform both the lay public and all the healthcare providers. And we also need professional society consensus statements that are specifically intended for the lay public on the subject of wearable detected HRF evaluation and talks and forums for the lay public should become a higher priority. And beyond simply enhancing the pretest probability, these efforts can also help lay individuals understand what AF is and what to do about it and why. For the private industry, the machine learning almost certainly has an important role in the interpretation of smartwatch derived data. And so they should develop the AI algorithm to, to, to improve device performance. And they should be socially responsible for the influence of technology on the market and share information between us. So this is a final slide. As I mentioned today, atrial fibrillation screening via these technology, technology tools will probably promote early atrial fibrillation diagnosis. However, whether wearable itself leads to a reduction of stroke incidence is another issue. But since there are reports showing the relationship between lower medication adherence and uh, increased stroke and mortality risk. Medication adherence is an important issue in, in reducing stroke risk after atrial fibrillation diagnosis. So we have developed atrial fibrillation apps, as I show you, the providing educational videos for atrial fibrillation knowledge and a reminder email for keeping drug adherence and collecting personal health records. And I hope atrial fibrillation apps and the consumer EKG devices, like Omelon devices, should be used together to reduce stroke risk and optimize treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katera, for this very interesting results of this, for this presentation. And we would like, now like to open the Q&A session. And uh, you've talked, Faisal, you've talked about opportunistic screening. That's screening in patients visiting their de general practitioner, the GPs. And that it's indicated for patients 65 years old or older and versus systematic screening in the patient population 75 years old or older. The first question regards this context and is, is there a gold standard diagnostic procedure to detect early atrial fibrillation? Thank you uh, for that question, Bert. So um, you, you're quite right. The guidelines do talk about um, you know, a systematic approach in those over 75, 75 or more versus, op versus opportunistic in those who are 65 or more. Really, the gold standard uh, for diagnosing atrial fibrillation remains uh, an, a 12 DCG, um, which a lot of our primary healthcare partners now have in their in their GP surgeries. Um, but of course, when you're talking about detecting, uh, diagnosing atrial fibrillation, you're talking about patients who may be at home, 
we used to, of course, you, we use the pulse check and even patients checking the pulse and the pulse being irregular. Professor Sonu very nicely showed that actually sensitivity and specificity is not, not too bad for that. But it's almost as a, as a, as a, uh, a reminder to a patient to go and seek healthcare, um, a, a, a professional, to, to actually have some kind of a rhythm strip or ECG taken. Where things are, I think are now changing is that patients are now wearing these devices that can measure their, their heart rhythm. Patients have these devices on their smart tablets, on their smartphones. So if they feel symptoms or if they feel their pulse and it's, it's irregular, they can actually check a tracing. So the, really the gold standard remains um, getting a 12 dd ECG or a rhythm strip that shows atrial fibrillation, a good quality version that a physician can look at and say, yes, this is atrial fibrillation. And the 30 second, the 30 second time frame that's been picked, it's, it's an arbitrary figure that's been picked, uh, but the European guidelines uh, have, have mentioned it. And in, interestingly, the Heart Rhythm Society in, in, in America also used the same time frame. So I think, you know, the, 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 the actual detection of these arrhythmias is moving more and more towards uh, patients having the technology to be able to record these rhythms now, I, I would say. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask you? Yeah. Okay. Please. So can I ask you, Professor Osman? So yes. the the I, I think the performance of EKG itself is is not associated with significant harm, but the abnormal results may cause and the the patient anxiety, and moreover, the misinterpretation of EKG results may lead to the misdiagnosis and the unnecessary treatment like uh, anticoagulant, anticoagulant therapy for stroke prevention, which is associated with the risk of bleeding. So what do you think of that? that that's a very, very good point there, Katero. So clearly, I mean, I, I often get emails from patients who've got smart devices or smart watches and tracings are sent, oh, I think I've got atrial fibrillation. And you look and you see clear artifact and it, and it, isn't, it isn't atrial fibrillation. And I think this is the key that us as healthcare professionals need to need to be involved, and not just clinicians, but also specialist nurses, allied healthcare professionals. The patients have access to all of these technologies that can that can record uh, these ECGs. Some of which will be of good quality, some which will not be of great quality. But it's important how that's dealt with. And before something is labelled as atrial fibrillation, the quality of the recording has to be good. And there needs to be some sort of formal assessment of the patient. And I think that's almost as critical as getting the recording. But you make a very, very good point. We are, all of us clinicians, uh, particularly in the field of EP, we are going to see more and more patients contacting us to ask about their tracings that they've got from their smartphones, their, their smart devices. Is this atrial fibrillation? And sometimes it can be very, very hard to tell because the quality is not always great. So, you know, I, you know, I would I, one of the questions that I was going to ask you, in fact, is, in terms of the devices that are out there, and you beautifully showed all of the devices that are out there, is there any, are there any devices that are better? Is it better to wear a, a, a watch which has better contact with the wrist, for example, or is it better to have some device that can, that can more reliably detect? It's the atrial activation that is the key to this. The QRS complications, of course, are very important if they're regular or irregular, but in your opinion, is there, is, are there any types of devices that are better than others? Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I agree, I agree with that. So the, according to my presentation, so the sensitivity is very, very high. So 99% and 100%. But uh, on the other hand, the specificity is 86%. So which means the false positive is 14%. So the, the, the majority, the reason is the, the combination of the premature atrial contraction and uh, motion, motion artifact or motion related drift. So those combination is a bad combination to, to, to the define, to the differentiate the sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. So the, I think uh, I, I recommend the, and uh, I need the, the AI algorithm to improve those, the device performance. Yeah. 
That but was very under, interesting. Yeah. And very important point. So we all know that smart watches cannot rule out atrial fibrillation. So you cannot only rely on these results. But I have another question for Kutaro. So in which patients should a 30 second single lead ECG tracing be performed? So do you have a specific group where you think it's best? Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very good question. So because the many wearable products are marketed as direct to consumer, so probably they will be the largely used by subject with healthier profi profiles, uh, 40, 50 years old, seen in the Apple Heart study. The mean age is 30 or 40. But I think the, it's necessary to identify appropriate target. For example, patient with heart, the hypertension or other modifiable stroke risk factors. And uh, I think uh, CHADS to score more than two and uh, having the repeated symptoms would be good. Okay. Well, there's another question here in the Q&A box and it's for Faisal. And the question is, um, is it possible to prescribe an oral antigulant to a patient with atrial fibrillation, chats VASC of five to seven, and esophageal varices stage one without cirrhosis? What is the drug of choice? That's a, that's a good question. So we, of course, have the NOAX available now. Um, and it's always a, it's interesting because the, the factors that we use in the chance of our scoring system, are, a lot of them are the very same factors that we use in has blood scoring as well. So a patient with a very high chance of score is likely to have a high bleeding score as well, potentially. But I think it is, it is very much a discussion with the patient. Um, I think in the past, we've always underestimated the risk of a stroke and overestimated the risk of bleeding. And therefore, you know, and this is, dates back to the days of warfarin only or vitamin K antagonists. But I think we're all moving towards the stage where we're recognizing that anticoagulant therapy should be given. Uh, and if there is a high bleeding risk, that we need to just look at what factors we can potentially modify that, that may cause that bleeding risk. In terms of agents and which one, um, as I say, I think Epixaban probably has um, the, the data which suggests that it's got the least bleeding potentially. Um, but I think you have to take the patient in front of you in, in, into factor. The kid renal function, of course, plays a part. Frailty and fragility, all of these factors are very, very important. So, and again, just touching on the ESC guidelines, talking about a very patient-centered uh, approach to managing atrial fibrillation. I think rather than just giving a blank, blanket statement and saying this anticoagulant for this patient, I think you have to assess the whole patient, look at their comorbidity, look at their actual risk, the chance of risk and their has blood score, and then come up with a decision. Very good. So I think the last question, because we're running out of time, is for Kataro again, and it's from the audience. And the question is, what kind of patients would you recommend to self-monitor for AF? Okay, thank you. So uh, as I show you, so the hypertension is high prevalent. Hypertension is high prevalent in atrial fibrillation, and the combination between the hypertension and the atrial fibrillation have the higher stroke risk. So the detection of, of atrial fibrillation during during the periodic the self monitoring of blood pressure using home automation devices by hypertensive patient has the advantage of being widely available in populations to screen for atrial fibrillation. And also, there is a cost-effective alternatives to, co to the current screening approach. So the, the screening of the large number of individuals is very costly, I think. So that it's very the important issue Okay. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of today's live webinar. And I hope that you all found it informative and that it's met its educational objectives. And I'd like again to remind you that this program was supported or is supported by Omron Healthcare. And I'd like 
again to thank my co-faculty, Faisal Osman, thank you very much for your talk and for the discussion. Thank you. And Katara Senu, thank you for being up so late during the night and giving your talk and for the discussion. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience and goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.